In this chapter of Indian geography, we would start with land use and agriculture. To begin with, I have a very interesting question for you. What is a difference between a reporting area versus a geographical area? Now, land records are maintained by revenue department. So, when we ask about the reporting area, it is the area which is simply added up as part of the land use categorization. We will understand what is land use categories in the next section. So land use categories, when all of those categories are added up, we call this as a reporting area. However, geographical area is the area which is delineated by the Survey of India and it says that these are the land boundaries and these are the administrative units of India. So the basic difference come here in the reporting area we understand that it is based on the estimates of the land revenue records okay so that is one of the most important thing and difference between a reporting area versus a geographical area however geographical area is the measurement results published by survey of india so when the results are through the land revenue records they are called as reporting area so be very careful when we are understanding the statistics to come up with the land use categories. Now broadly there are these nine land use categories which are explained. The first one is forest. Definitely we all know forest and we say 33% of the land cover should be under forest area. But the actual forest is different from the forest that is explained. So the forest that is explained is identified by the government as a forest area. It need not be an actual forest. Probably it was forest at some point of time. Now it is not the case. So please note there is a difference between the actual forest and the forest that we classify here and this forest is the demarcation which is done by the government agencies the next is the land put to non-agricultural use the name suggests it's very simply so it is the land which is involved with industries with services with any kind of secondary or tertiary sector. So that is non-agriculture. The next is barren or waste land. Now, waste land or barren land is a land which has been kept empty, we can say, or it was previously involved with agriculture and now is not fertile, is no more useful. So that is a barren or a waste land. The next is the area under permanent pastures and grazing land. Now, these can either be owned by the panchayats or they can be part of the CPR. CPR is nothing but the common property resources. What are common property resources? In the village if you go you have canals, you have wells which is utilized by everyone in the village and therefore it is a common property and we call this as a common property resource. So area under permanent pastures, grazing area where everyone's cow can come and graze on that land is the area which is known as the common property area. The next is the culturable wasteland. Now, very very important to understand the difference between culturable wasteland current fallow and fallow other than current fallow. The difference is very very simple. Culturable wasteland is a land which is left fallow for more than five years. Understand time period very very important. So culturable wasteland is left fallow for more than five years. Current fallow is a land which does not have any cultivation for less than or one year. So current fallow is one year, culturable wasteland is more than five years, anything between one to five would go into fallow other than current fallow. So it's not current fallow, not less than one year and it is fallow other than current fallow that means anything which has been left for a period which is more than one year but less than five year because if it is more than five year it would go into the other classification which is culturable wasteland. The next is net zone area. Net zone area is a very important de uh, demarcation of how much crops are actually sown and harvested. So the physical extent of the land on which the crops are sown, the crops are harvested would lead you to the net zone area. 
and gross zone area is the total amount of crop which is cultivated from that net zone area so from the same parcel of land there can be two crops in the season and if there are two crops it would be counted twice but the area is counted once getting the point so that is the difference here and the last is the area under miscellaneous tree crops and grooves now this is the area which is mainly for the tree crop cropping purpose now what is important is out of these land use categorizations over the various uh, uh, census demarcations the classification and the categorization of land use had always been changing but we always say that there have been some broad categories which have remained unchanged to bring it into the point or into the light we have three areas under which the land use categorization has increased over the years and the first one is forest now when i say forest as i mentioned in the starting the demarcated forest areas have increased we are still not sure about the actual forest cover whether it has increased or not but as per the survey the demarcated area that we have put under the forest classification has increased the next is area under non agricultural use definitely this has increased because we are now moving towards secondary and tertiary sector economy so area under non agricultural use has increased and the last increase that we have witnessed is the current fallow now current fallow as we said is a land which is kept fallow for a period of one year less than or one year now this the data is dicey why because if there is a good rainfall in this season this value would decrease if there is a bad monsoon the value would increase and therefore we can say we cannot rely wholeheartedly on this data because this can fluctuate with the monsoon variations and since india is predominantly a monsoon land we need to keep this into account that current fallow on a year to year basis can fluctuate and therefore we need to have a uh, data for a substantial period of time in order to understand it now land use changes in india have brought about three major changes or three major impacts we could say one is the size of economy the size of economy is measured in terms of all the goods as well as all the services that a country produces now this explains the economy now the size of the economy changes with income levels with the technologies with the factors associated with technology and ultimately the pressure on the land similarly the composition of economy also is very very important whether the economy is predominantly a primary economy how much gdp is generated from primary sector whether the economy is moving towards secondary or tertiary economy and how much gdp is generated from the respective sectors so secondary economy tertiary economy or primary economy we need to identify that the next is the pressure on the agricultural land area now note as we have seen with rising population the number of people sustaining on the same parcel of land have increased that means where one farmer was involved with let's say 1 hectare of land 5 years ago now there are probably 10 people who are involved with that parcel of land and therefore the pressure on the agricultural land has increased in two fold ways one is the population pressure that's the obvious physical pressure that we could see on the land area the next is the distribution of food and this could probably lead to issues regarding food security in future so the number of the people that the agricultural sector can actually sustain changes rapidly and if there are many people involved on the same parcel of land because the parcel of the land that we have within the country is a limited resource it's not an unlimited resource so when it is a limited resource we need to understand that how much people or how many people can actually sustain on that land parcel and therefore this very important factor makes or assures the fact that the pressure on the agricultural land needs to be uh, reduced now when we talk about land the ownership of the land can be in two forms one is the private ownership and the second is the community ownership so community ownership is the ownership which we call as cpr the common property resource that we focused on and these 
are owned by a group or the community of people canals uh, wells are some of the good example grazing lands are some of the good examples of common property resources owned and maintained by everyone in the community so understand this in a very simple way i am located in a village and i have my house and my boundaries for the house there is one of my neighbors who has his house and the boundaries of the house so the house and the boundaries of the house are the private resource which are to be owned and maintained by us individually however outside that whatever it is is the common property resource so be it the forest area be it the the transport area everything in the village would be maintained by everyone collectively so pastoral land water bodies uh, irrigation centers uh, solar centers if any public spaces if any are all examples of common property resources which are to be maintained with uh, people on a whole now in india agricultural land use is very very important we all know why because we say that india is predominantly an agrarian society which is based on or which is highly dependent on monsoon so in india agriculture is one of the major land based activities and over the years land quality has been questioned so recently soil health cards have been issued and this land quality has a direct relation or is proportionally related to the productivity better the quality of land higher the productivity lower the quality of land lower the productivity lower per hectare yield that would be seen also with land there is an associated idea of security a sense of security with the farmers a sense of social belongingness a sense of social value which is attached to land ownership and therefore land use in india becomes an very important aspect to discuss now when we talk about the total cultivable area in this section we would understand how that is classified so this data is a little old data based on the differences of 1960s to 2002 and 3 when the land use classification was studied and this talks about the four cultivable criteria those are the cultivable wasteland areas which have been left for more than 5 years current fallow for one year and other uh, fallow other than current fallow for one to five years duration and then the net zone area we have seen that as a percentage the current fallow land has significantly increased however the cultivable wasteland reduced now understand this very carefully this is a total land parcel which is as i repeat again geographically limited so if one of the parameters is increasing definitely there has to be a change in the other parameter and there is no way other out except this okay so we need to understand that if the current fallow is increasing the land which has been fallow for less than 1 year is increasing there is some other criteria which is actually decreasing and that is the cultivable based land if we talk about as a percentage of the total cultivated area so this was an uh, as a percentage of the reporting area as a percentage of total cultivable area we have seen that despite a increase in the reporting area the increase has not been that significant for the current fallow and there has been a marginal reduction in the net zone area the ultimate a uh, relation has remained same but the important thing that we need to understand here is with changes in technology with changes in land use patterns with changes in land use intensity there has been a significant change in the various parameters which are observed now cropping intensity if we say how intensely you are cropping on the same parcel of land can be calculated as a ratio of gross crop area to net sown area net sown area is the land parcel which is sown and harvested gross crop area is how many crops you have witnessed on the same parcel of the land so let's say in i have two scenarios land parcel a and land parcel b in land parcel a i had only one crop in one season so my cropping intensity was less however in land b on the same parcel of the land i grew crops thrice a season 
the land was available for kharif rabi as well as zayed season and therefore my cropping intensity was intensively high as compared to land b sorry land a and therefore we understand that it's not just the land how intensely the land is cultivated is again a very important aspect to understand now here we have a quick graph to help you memorize the kharif rabi and the zayed crops now kharif coincides with the southwest monsoon therefore the sowing season is in the month of somewhere around june and it harvest in the months of september october some of the common crops which we relate to the kharif season are paddy maize jowar bajra tuwar moong urad cotton groundnut the common crops that you see during the monsoon time so you might enjoy maize and you might enjoy groundnut during the uh, river side in the monsoon season so this is the kharif crops now which are the states where you have the kharif crop we have again marked those states here important to note most of the cultivation of the tropical crops are part of kharif crop the next is rabi rabi starts with the winter season so at the onset of the winter season usually in the month of october november there is a sowing season and this ends in the month of march and april where the crop is harvested what is obtained which crops are uh, seen during that time during the month of march and april we witness wheat and therefore people stock wheat for the year round purpose during that time so the fresh things that come during that time is wheat barley jowar gram mustard uh, linseed rape seed so those are some of the common crops which are obtained during the rabi season the next is the zayed season a small season where mostly watermelons cucumbers musk melons and fruits and vegetables are grown it starts with the end of the rabi season and before the beginning of the kharif season so that 2 3 months is the period where you have the zayed crops zayed crops are usually uh having a lot of fodder crops as well so that is a simple classification to understand the three cropping patterns and the cropping seasons which are present coming on next is the types of farming based on the amount of moisture we have we can say that either there can be a irrigated belt or a rain fed belt india is a monsoon land so a lot of land would depend on rain and therefore we call this as rain fed farming which is dependent on rain for the farming purpose the next is the land which is irrigated irrigated by either canals wells tube wells or so on so this irrigated land area can be classified further into two types one is protective the other is productive what is the difference protective protects the crop from any adverse effects of soil moisture deficiency and therefore acts as uh, the irrigation actually acts as a supplementary way to provide water wherever above the rainfall it is required so whatever the rainfall was let's say this was the threshold for the rainfall anything top of that if it is required that amount would be fulfilled through the protective irrigation and therefore we call this protective because it protects the crop from falling short of moisture and therefore this is protective the next is productive productive is where sufficient soil moisture is given to ensure highest productivity so here our idea is not protecting the soil but production productivity higher yield so based on if we see that if more moisture is given in if more water is given more productivity can be obtained then definitely more water would be given in order to increase the productivity we are not just protecting that this the crop should not destroy or the crop should not be damaged the goal is higher productivity so the irrigated land parcel can have either be based on protective aspect or productive aspect the next is the rain fed rain fed farming is classified based on the water availability so the first one is the dry land farming dry land farming is usually done in the region where there is less than 75 cm of rainfall so if the rainfall is less than 75 cm we say 
it is a dry land farming and some of the common examples are what we know well all kind of coarse grains millets jowar bajra ragi uh, uh, gram are some of the good examples of dry land farming wetland farming intense water is available water floods at point of time and therefore what are the crops associated to it rice sugar cane all crops which are water intensive require lots and lots of water so rice sugar sugar cane jute are some of the examples of wetland farming so this is a very basic classification to understand types of farming based on moisture availability now let's understand once we have the farming definitely we would have something to eat so food grains now what is the classification for food grains we can have cereals pulses fibers sugar cane tea coffee probably to wake you up right now so those are some of the crops that we obtain now the types of food grains we classify again the first and the most important classification we do is cereals and the most elaborate classification also the other ones are relatively smaller so cereals the most important one we would discuss five major cereals wheat the most prominent one in india followed by rice the next popular one and then three important coarse grains which are jowar maize and bajra now 54% of the total occupied land in india for cropping is dedicated to cereals so cereals account for some of the most important proportion india is a country that produces 11% of the cereals demanded across the world so again a major producer in terms of world requirement and it ranks third in production of cereals after china and us now the varieties we have discussed fine grains and coarse grains so let's discuss them one by one let's first talk about some of the coarse grains bajra Gro grown in hot dry atmosphere this is considered as a hardy crop because it is highly resistant to drought can grow well with very less amount of water and therefore seen where definitely in the west and the northwest india so those are the areas where we would see the crops of bajra we would understand those with the map again towards the end 5.2% of the total land is occupied under bajra cultivation and some of the major states now producing bajra include maharashtra as well so maharashtra gujarat up rajasthan and haryana are the major states which produce bajra the next is maize maize is a food and a fodder crop it is required by human beings as well as by animals so food as well as a fodder crop lesser amount of area is under maize cultivation in contrast to bajra bajra was somewhere around 5% here it is somewhere around 3.6% maize is a crop which is very very interesting because it grows across india except northeast and east so if you are looking to have maize this season try not to visit northeast okay the main producers are madhya pradesh the central belt the malwa region andhra pradesh karnataka kerala uh, sorry rajasthan and uttar pradesh are some of the major areas where you have high quality maize now the yield per crop the yield that the, that's the productivity of maize is higher in south india as compared to north india and again the yield for the maize is higher with respect to other crops and other coarse grains which are grown so maize becomes one of the major crops most interesting crops during the monsoon months the next is jowar now jowar is interesting jowar is a crop which is both kharif and as well as rabi now when i say kharif it is mainly in the north area or the north india it acts as a kharif crop and it's mainly used for fodder purpose however in the south it is mainly a rain fed crop it's not dependent on irrigation and has lower yield in central and south india the semi arid belts the dry belts usually witness production of jowar 
Some of the common states where we see higher production of jowar are Maharashtra. So Maharashtra was one of the good producers for bajra as well and then for jowar again a lot of coarse grains from Maharashtra followed by Madhya Pradesh, Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. So that is about jowar. Coming on next is wheat and rice. So wheat the second most important cereal after rice in world okay so in the world it is second most important cereal after rice and in the regions of india mainly in the central belt of india we say it is one of the predominant crops however the coastal areas we say rice is one of the predominant crops Overall, 14% of the geographical area is covered by wheat. It is one of the temperate crops and grown mainly in the central and north India. 85% of it grows in central and north India. Mainly the Indo-Gangetic plain, the regions of Punjab, Haryana which flourished after Green Revolution and in the regions of Malwa Plateau, where the extension of Deccan Plateau, it's mainly a rain-fed crop which is dependent on monsoon. 12% of the total wheat production in the world comes from India. So India is one of the major producers of wheat. What are the regions where you have maximum wheat production? Uttar Pradesh, Punjab, Haryana, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan are some of the major states where we have wheat production, the northern, the central belt of India. Punjab, Haryana, as we said, flourished after Green Revolution and also they have higher yields because of the Green Revolution, high yielding variety, the HYV seeds which were used and the regions of Madhya Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh usually are rain fed, so moderate amount of yield is seen. Rice is a staple crop, staple crop across the globe and more than 3000 varieties of rice is present. It is grown from sea level to a height of 2000 meters high and therefore huge extent in which rice can grow requires more water, it is water intensive relatively. 22% of the rice production in the world comes from India. So a significant production in terms of world proportion is from India. It is second, uh, second largest producer after China. So India is second largest producer after China. And one fourth of the total cropped area is actually the uh, belt under rice. In West Bengal, this rice is cultivated as three forms those are Aus, Aman and Boro. However, in most of the areas in north, uh, it's mainly because of the southwest monsoon that hits and therefore it is a kharif crop during the monsoon months. So rice is predominantly a crop which is grown in the monsoon season. However, in West Bengal, you have three cropping seasons across which rice is grown or Aus, Aman and Boro. Now, the coastal belt is the area where you have huge production of rice but with green revolution and huge amount of uh, uh, irrigation facilities available in Punjab and Haryana, rice became a major crop in the regions of Punjab, Punjab and Haryana as well. However, later the water tables started to drop in Punjab and Haryana which significantly affected the cropping patterns in Punjab and Haryana. So originally it is a water intensive crop. Artificially the water amount was made surplus in these areas and therefore rice became one of the popular crops but uh, with the green revolution we have seen numerous uh, implications on the quality of water and the water resources in long term with rice cultivations in the regions of Punjab and Haryana. So after 1970s, uh, there was a period of 20 to 30 years where Green Revolution significantly changed the way of life in the regions of Punjab and Haryana. The crops flourished extremely good. But over the past few years, we have realized that the soil quality has deteriorated with use of high amount of fertilizers and pesticides. The water bodies are now... Uh, now uh, uh, affected. Also, the water tables have gone significantly down, which have created numerous grey zones and dark zones in Punjab and Haryana. Water scarcity has become one of the major reasons. 
Rice is also a rain-fed crop in most of the coastal areas where rainfall during the monsoon months is abundant. The next food grain that we discuss is pulses. Definitely, if you are having chapati, you would like to have some kind of dal with it. Or if you are having rice, you would like to have some dal. So what is this pulses? These pulses are those dal that we talk. And the most common ones among those are gram and tuar. The two most common forms of pulses. Pulses are by default having higher amount of nitrogen and are important source of nitrogen fixation and therefore wherever one crop is grown usually we have pulses grown with it so that the soil naturally increases the uh, the amount of nitrogen and nitrogen fixation occurs in the soil. India is a leading producer of pulses and one-fifth of the total production of pulses across the globe comes from India. Mainly Deccan area and Northwest Belt are the areas where higher amount of pulses are cultivated. Let's talk about these two important pulses, the gram and the tuar. Gram is a subtropical crop. It is a rabi crop sown during the winter months. Commonly seen in Central, West and Northwest India, 2.8% of the land area is covered under, uh, uh, under gram. With just one or two good showers, good monsoon showers, gram can start to flourish and uh, mainly along with rice or wheat, so Punjab and Haryana are some of the areas where we have seen higher proportion of gram cultivation along with Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Rajasthan as some of the major centers. However, the amount of pulses and the production fluctuates based on year to year and availability of irrigation in those areas. The next is tuar. Tuar is also known as red gram or pigeon pea. It is usually seen in central and south states of India. 2% of the total cropped area falls under tuar and one third of the total production is from Maharashtra. Tuar is the second most important pulse across all the pulses and Maharashtra as we said is again a major producer. What were the major productions in Maharashtra? We already studied Bajra and Jwar were some of the major productions in Maharashtra. With those coarse grains we have tuar so that nitrogen fertility remains in the soil and natural fertility of the soil does not lose. Besides this uh, tuar is also grown, grown in Uttar Pradesh. We have Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, the Malwa Belt, Rajwar, all kind of crops are some of the other centers where we have this. The next is oil seeds. Oil seeds are those seeds which are used to extract oil. So we say groundnut oil as a common oil. Groundnut, uh, mustard and rapeseed are some of the common oil seeds. Besides that, we have two another important ones. Those are soya bean and sunflower. So let's talk about these little ones first. So soya bean. Soya bean is mainly seen in Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra. Three important states where you have soya bean cultivation. Karnataka, Maharashtra and Andhra Pradesh. I repeat again. And uh, this is the area where uh, you see Sorry, uh, so soya bean and sunflower, uh, just a second. So soya bean and sunflower, so the three important states that I mentioned are for groundnut. So those are the Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra. Soya bean is seen in the Malwa belt. So Madhya Pradesh is one of the major centers for soya bean production and uh, Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra together account for 90% of the total soya bean cultivation across India. The next is sunflower. Sunflower again we have a higher concentration in the regions of Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra and they are required for uh, cultivation mainly because of irrigation. So irrigation is highly required for this crop and this is a very minor oil seed crop which is grown. Groundnut is the most important one. Now groundnut as I said Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, then we also have Gujarat as some of the major producers. 14% of the world production comes from India. Sorry, 17% of the world production comes from India, which covers only 3.6 geographical uh, 
जियोग्राफिकल एरिया ऑफ इंडिया इट इज अ क्रॉप विच इज एंजॉय ड्यूरिंग द मानसून मंथ सो अगेन अ खरीफ क्रॉप दैट वी कैन रिमेंबर बट नोट इन साउथ इट इज अ रावी क्रॉप ग्रोन इन विंटर्स सो अ मेजर डिफरेंस फॉर द ग्राउंड नट इट इज अ खारिफ एज वेल एज रावी क्रॉप खारिफ इन द नॉर्थ बेल्ट रावी इन द सदर्न बेल्ट रेप सीड और मस्टर्ड विच इज द राई सरसो तामरिया और द तुरिया एज इट इज कॉल्ड एज इज अ सब ट्रॉपिकल क्रॉप यूजअली अ राबी क्रॉप इन नॉर्थ एंड नॉर्थ वेस्ट एंड टू थर्ड ऑफ दिस क्रॉप इज ग्रोन ओनली बाय इरीगेशन सो उत्तर प्रदेश हरियाणा वेस्ट बंगाल मध्य प्रदेश आर सम ऑफ द कॉमन एरियाज एंड देन वी ऑल्सो हैव हायर यील्ड इन द रीजन्स ऑफ हरियाणा एंड राजस्थान फॉर रेप सीड एंड मस्टर्ड मस्टर्ड इज इज वॉज एक्सटेंसिवली सीन एज अ रिजल्ट ऑफ ग्रीन रेवोल्यूशन इन द रीजन्स ऑफ पंजाब हरियाणा सो अगेन वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टू नोट इट इज अ राबी क्रॉप ग्राउंड नट इज बोथ अ खारिफ एंड अ राबी क्रॉप द डिफरेंस बिकम्स वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टू स्टडी the next is fiber two important fibers that we would understand jute and cotton now jute is a coarse fiber used to make coarse grains ropes uh strengthening material and it is one of the very famous cash crops in west bengal however prior to the partition of india most of the crop production areas were in bangladesh and the mills the jute mills were lo located in india even after we lost most of the jute production centers to bangladesh we have 3/5 of the world production for jute and the major states where we produce jute as of now are bihar and assam and parts of west bengal as well and it accounts for only 0.5% of the total crop area in the country the next important crop is cotton it is a tropical kharif crop usually grown during the monsoon months in the semi arid areas the most important thing is it requires a clear sky when it is flowering so when the cotton seeds are flowering they require a clear sky very very important condition and 200 days which are moist free it is a fourth important crop in the world in terms of production india is the fourth important center after china us and pakistan important to note after partition of india and pakistan major crop production areas went to cotton production areas went to pakistan so two partitions that we had one with pakistan and other with bangladesh with bangladesh we lost the jute producing areas with pakistan partition we lost the cotton producing centers so both of these production centers were significantly affected by the partition of the country india accounts for 4.7% of the total uh, land area which is under um, cultivation so 4.7% area is under cultivation and 8.7% of the total world cotton is produced from india the per hectare output Uh, the per hectare output is higher mainly in the northwest areas the areas closer to the region of partition and lower amount of yield is seen from maharashtra and southern states so the northwest states perform well in terms of yield or output the next is the other three important crops coffee tea and sugarcane so let's take a break and have some tea and coffee so coffee plantations are usually usually in the tropical areas there are three important varieties in coffee arabica robusta and liberica arabica is the most superior form and it is the most cultivated form in india and 4.3% of the total coffee production of the world comes from india but despite of that india ranks 6th in the world production in coffee after brazil Vietnam, uh, Colombia, Indonesia and Mexico India ranks in Brazil uh, India ranks in coffee so Brazil Vietnam uh, Colombia Indonesia and Mexico some of the leading producers for coffee cultivation next is tea plantation now tea plantation tea is again a plantation crop Assam West Bengal are the areas north west bengal siliguri darjeeling are the areas where tea cultivation is commonly witnessed now when the leaves are unfermented these leaves are green the tea leaves are green then we ferment it and finally the black tea is produced 
The tea is highly rich in two components, caffeine and tannin. Both of those are extremely higher uh, proportions which are present in tea. Tea is usually seen in a hilly, well-drained areas in humid and some humid subhumid tropical conditions. The cultivation for tea started in 1840s in the Brahmaputra Valley of Assam area and slowly then it is spread to the regions of West Bengal, uh, Darjeeling, Jalpaiguri, Kuch Bengal, uh, Kuch Bihar are some of the areas where tea cultivation uh, spread to and then in the south again Nilgiris, Cardamom Hills where we have tea cultivation but the quality of tea significantly varies. India is one of the leading producers of tea with 28% of the total world production coming from India, a major export industry in the world after two nations, what are those? Sri Lanka and China. So China, Taiwan known for Olong tea, yellow tea, uh, Sri Lanka again known for tea varieties but India is again a major producer, major exporter of tea, 28% of our exports come directly from Tamil Nadu and West Bengal, West Bengal being the highest followed by Tamil Nadu. The next important crop is sugarcane. Now sugarcane is grown both in the north as well as south. It is a tropical rain-fed crop seen in the humid and the subhumid areas. India is the second largest producer of sugarcane after Brazil. 23% of the world production comes from India for sugarcane and 2% of the total cropped area. With just 2% of the cropped area, we have 23% of the world production. And again, this is a labor intensive crop. Uttar Pradesh itself produces two fifths of the total sugar canes across India. Uh, most of the common states that we see in the north are Uttar Pradesh and in the south are Maharashtra, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. Then there you have higher proportion of sugar in the south versus north so that's again a different thing that we would cover separately so this is a general map to help you understand the areas of cultivation of various crops so bajra cultivation as you can see mainly in the north you have a significant proportion in the parts of maharashtra uh, the eastern maharashtra and northwest india then we have rice production across the coastal areas with higher cultivation in the east and the northeast. Wheat cultivation mainly in the central belt of India. Sugar cane both in the north and the south. Then tea pockets in the regions of Kerala, Tamil Nadu, uh, the Nilgiri and the Cardamon Hills. And then in the regions of Jalpaiguri, Kuch Bihar in West Bengal and parts of Assam. Then we also have coffee production in South India. The jute cultivation is seen in the regions of West Bengal, Bihar and Assam and uh, the cotton cultivation in the regions of Deccan and Malwa and then we have rubber cultivation which is also seen in South uh, which was not part of this NCRT syllabus so we had not discussed it. Coming on to agricultural development in India. So just after independence we saw that we need to become self-reliant. India was a land which was facing acute food crisis and to make ourselves food independent was one of the major ideas. So three things were adopted. First was any land which was a fallow land should be brought under cultivation. If there is a cash crop which is cultivated, it should be immediately shifted to a food crop and the intensification of the crop should be increased. That means rather than having one crop in one year, we should at least aim for two crops in one year. And that was the only way to meet the food demands and the food insecurity that existed in the country. However, with development, uh, we saw that a lot of food security issues were resolved and India became a food self-sufficient nation. However, our agricultural practices were primitive and our practices were stagnating till 1950s, 1970s. So in 1970s, we started with green revolution with more HYV seeds, high yielding variety seeds, chemicals, fertilizers, pesticides which were used, expansion of irrigation. We witnessed a sudden boom in agricultural production. This boom brought India to a state where we were ready to bring in exports to other countries. With more of fertilizers, pesticides, we were able to establish ourselves with higher production. India became the first in terms of pulses, tea, uh, jute, cattle, milk. 
India became second in terms of wheat, rice, groundnut. So India started to have a huge amount of self-reliance in food grain production globally and the average consumption of the world was able we were able to answer the issues of consumption worldwide but still india faces huge problems with agriculture we need to address these problems before we bring in further developments in agriculture the first is higher dependence on monsoon still we have most of the land parcels which are dependent on uh, monsoon and therefore erratic behavior the unprecedented behavior of monsoon affects cultivation in india only 33 percent of the land is actually under cultivation based on irrigation that means still 67 percent of the land is dependent on monsoon the next is lower productivity the small farming size and the farm holdings where equipments and technology cannot be brought so one parcel of the land broken down into two parcels between two sons further bro broken down or demarcated fragmented into four brings in smaller land parcels and these smaller land parcels are unable to sustain technological advancements bringing of tra tractors machineries farm equipments does not remain sustainable and therefore we are still a subsistence based economy that means most of the farmers are growing for their own needs own requirement there is a huge unemployment and uh, uh, unstructured employment disguised employment unemployment we can say why do we call it disguised because a farm actually needs two persons let's say to uh, cultivate crops in that region but there are five persons who are involved with the same activity why because they do not find employment anywhere across and they remain on the same parcel showing that they are contributing something to the production but actually they are not and this is what is called as disguised unemployment so a very high amount of disguised unemployment is witnessed in the agricultural land uh, there is lack of technological advancement like lack of commercialization also financial resources are constrained for example a farmer buys certain uh, fertilizers takes a loan to get certain fertilizers for the crop but this year monsoon was not good the crop could not uh, come as he wished for and as a result he was un unable to repay the loan amount so what happened was neither he was able to gain through the crop that was grown because the crop production was not good or the crop was either destroyed because of floods because of famine whatsoever the condition was the crop did not help him repay the loan as a result he was unable to repay the loan but next year to have the crop again he need to get something back to his farm so he takes again another loan for bringing in crops or bringing in cultivation for the next season and this is what we call as a vicious cycle of financial debt that a farmer undergoes so the farmer is consistently into a cycle where he is unable to come out of his loans of his repayments and therefore a huge amount of financial constraint always linger with agriculture in india the next important is lack of uh, the land reforms in india now mahalwari rothwari and zamindari were the three major british period land systems that existed in india and over the years despite of independence we have seen that the implementations for land reform have not been effective due to weak political will and smaller sizes of land parcels that started to uh, happen. Also, a lot of soil nowadays is affected by salinity issue, by alkalinity issue because of the higher use of um, chemicals, fertilizers, pesticides, more of underground water being dug. Uh, this is one of the issues that have cropped ma mainly in the areas of Punjab, Haryana and the Indra Gandhi Canal where huge amount of water logging, siltation, uh, uh, salinity is witnessed. 
also leguminous crops have been displaced now when leguminous crops are displaced and the land is kept fallow that means these leguminous crops were able to naturally regain the fertility of the soil in terms of nitrogen now that fertility cannot be regained and we use artificial fertilizers for the same and this further deteriorates the quality of the soil so those are some of the problems that we have with agriculture to address these problems we have brought in schemes like soil health card uh, jam trinity where we are talking about bringing in financial inclusiveness bringing in more uh, pradhan mantri krishi sichai yojana for irrigation for insurance fasal bima yojana those are some of the schemes that have been released by the government in order to address the actual problems of agriculture but these problems are still very very deep and addressing them at the right time becomes the need of the hour so this was about the chapter on agriculture we would be covering many other chapters in geography you can check out the playlist for ncert 6 to 12 for all the coverage on geography topics wish you a very good luck for preparation